welcome to the newest episode of On The Odd. If you have a story you would like to share and you would like to come on to the show to share it, please email me at mark, M-A-R-K, at ontheodd.com. From the paranormal to the extraordinary, from the weird to the wonderful, this is On The Odd. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Nicholas Pearson. He has been immersed in all aspects of the mineral kingdom for more than 20 years. Nicholas developed a profound love for rocks and minerals in early childhood, and his passion grew to include the spiritual benefits about stones from cultures all around the world. He began teaching crystal workshops in high school and later studying mineral science at Stetson University's Gillespie um, I'm sorry, my uh, thing, what museum is it? I'm sorry, Gillespie Museum. I'm sorry, my my uh, thing kind of glitched out. I apologize. <laughs> I'll fix that. Um, a certified teacher in Reiki Rioho and a practitioner in Jikiden Reiki. He teaches crystal and Reiki classes throughout the United States. The author of The Seven Archetypal Stones and Crystals for Karmic Healing, Nicholas lives in Orlando, Florida with his partner, and I hope you have a season pass for Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we don't. But, oh, okay. you know, my, my partner used to work there, so we used to get the free tickets and That's we're just kind of cool. Disneyed out for a little bit. Yeah, I guess it's like being a New Yorker and um, not going to the Statue of Liberty, you know. <laughs> it's like fourth right. grade trip. I uh, had enough. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. And, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, anytime. And now that you've been on, um, I'm going to you know hit you up every once in a while and say, "Come on, come back." <laughs> and you'll say, "No, not since last time. Not what you after what you did." No. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the quotes that I came across about you was um, the author of Temple of Witchcraft wrote. Um, his name is Christopher um, Pengzak. He wrote, Nicholas Pearson uses the history, myth, and science of the stones to create experiences that allow you to directly engage with their energies and spiritual lessons. I just think that's such a cool quote. And um, it's it's just one of these things, and I'm familiar with that book series. Um, I just think that's, a, from him, I, I think that's a really cool thing to say. But it's also kind of, um, <clears throat> it's what I seek out. I want to, I don't want to just know why rose quartz do, has certain properties or why it does this. Um, I want to know the history of it. I want to know, um, you know, uh, under what conditions and if those conditions don't exist, what I can do to kind of um, help, um, help the stone or, or something like that. <clears throat> and so I guess essentially the, the question that you probably get asked first is, have you always been into stones? And is this is something that goes back to early childhood? I know in high school you, you were really deeply involved in it, but does it go a lot uh, further than that? It does. You know, I, I was the type of little kid who picked up rocks everywhere he went, and I've never stopped being that person. Mm -hmm. I still do. Um, it didn't matter if it was a state park, the beach, my grandparents' neighbor's gravel driveway, if there was just the right rock, it came home with me. And, you know, my grandfather recognized this love I had for all things stone. Mm. And he gave me my very first piece of quartz. Um, it's a specimen that comes from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but I was maybe the, the ripe old age of eight. Mm -hmm. And that's when my, my mineral obsession started in proper. And, um, you know, I've, I've never really looked back. I've done a lot of different things. Since then, I've, I've worn a lot of different hats, but the, the one constant in my life has been coming back to the mineral kingdom. And, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I love that, history. by the way, when you see the yeah. mineral kingdom. It, it really, <clears throat> and it's so true. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the, the history, the mythology, the culture, the science 
um, everything. I, I love every little piece of it. Mm. Um, I, I also, I've been around it all of my life. Um, it's something that, although I've been around, I, I never, I haven't gotten into it quite in the way that you have. Um, you've done a lot of research and studying and using them in different practices. Um, and what I'm kind of wondering is, do you see that there is like over the course of the past few decades, um, there have been ups and downs with the use of it. I think you know the popularity of Reiki was really prevalent throughout the nine, 1990s. I have to say 1990s now. Um, the 1990s, and I, I think it's in the past maybe five years becoming another. Um, it's becoming popular again, but there was definitely a point where it kind of slowed down. You didn't hear about it so much. At least I didn't. And um, I, I think I'm in those circles a bit. Um, and I was just wondering if, if you found that to be the case, like, are there, I guess, trends having to do with these things? You know, when, when you really talk to like the dedicated practitioners, wh- whatever might be going on in pop culture doesn't really reflect what's happening in those circles. So mm-hmm. I, I haven't seen much of an ebb. I've only seen these things continue to rise. Mm-hmm. And as they become more and more mainstream, you know, there's greater and greater demand from people within the community to put forth what they've got to, to share with the world. So I think we're going to see a steady increase, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. Hmm. Um, where do you recommend people, I guess, begin? Now, you have a number of books that might fall into the category of <clears throat> of um, beginning and getting involved in all of this. You have a book called Foundations of um, Ricky Rio. <laughs> I'm butchering mm-hmm. that. I'm sorry. Um, Ricky Rioho, and where you talk about the position, the hand positions for Reiki, and um, the you get really deeper into it about the different levels of it and the the mechanism behind it. Um, do you also discuss the physical use of stones and Reiki in that particular manual? Um, not really. Uh, you know, I kind of treat my Reiki practice and my crystal practice as two separate things. Mm, okay. uh, historically speaking, there is not much link between the two until you get to North America in the 1990s and beyond. Um, you know, you can say, I can say quite firmly that up until, you know, 1980, the two never mixed. Really? Yes. So wow. this is a completely Westernized thing. Um, my, my particular Reiki practice is heavily influenced by the original teachings of Reiki in Japan. Um, and a big part of what I do in Reiki as a, as a teacher, as a practitioner, as an advocate, is going back to those origins as best we can. Mm-hmm. You know, almost a century later, there are things that are probably ir- irreparably lost and forgotten. There are things that have evolved both in Japan and, you know, even more here in North America and the rest of the world. Um, but when we can kind of follow those common threads back to the beginning, then we start to understand why we do the things we do and what those things actually mean. So I like to strip it down. Um, you know, there is a very deep and profound philosophy behind the practice of Reiki, mm-hmm. but you know, ultimately it's a very simple set of procedures. And the, the more we tack things onto it, like auras and chakras and crystals and colors, um, the more we kind of lose the beauty in its simplicity. We lose that sort of Japanese aesthetic. And um, I really just appreciate everything about the, the sort of history and origins, as well as the deeper symbolism of the practice. So I, I try not to mix in too much when I, when I engage. You know, I'm hearing from more and more people who do research on, you know, no, regardless of what it is, whether it be uh, Reiki or, um, you know, different healing and um, or just anything. It's a the newest movement, it seems, and it's the most logical one. And and you hit the nail on the head is getting to the roots of it, like the crux of all right, where is the foundation for where this all came from? Because all of the everything that came after, although it might be nice to condense things, it's great to um, create new associations. It's never going to be as pure as that first um, or or the first level of understanding. And uh, I really respect that a lot because I'm I, I'm a lover of history and even has history in general. Like you know, you should always go back to the original article instead of reading the one that was written about the article. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I do appreciate that and respect it. It's just an important way to capture history, um, uh, regardless of <laughs> you know some sometimes I guess um, 
like, for instance, you were saying how crystals didn't even get introduced to the world of Reiki until um, you were saying 1980s. And, you know, that blows me away, actually, as somebody who is a part of the New Age movement of the late 80s and 90s. Um, I, I guarantee you there's a lot of people who don't know that. And I'm sure you meet them all the time. <laughs> I do, yes. But that's great that you're bringing to the forefront that little piece of knowledge. And um, it really does open up the entire, um, you know, um, it, it speaks volumes of the research that you've done and where you've gone for your research. Um, so when you get stones, um, I'm, gonna, I'm going to guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a lover of processed stones, like polished and cut and perfectly um, created. You know, you take a, a crystal and you basically make a nice, perfectly shaped um, pyramid or something. Um, do you prefer it in its raw state? Uh, I actually think that there are some mineral specimens that we, we can best appreciate in the raw and others that we really only unlock their beauty when we polish them. Hmm. You know, let's let's take an example of one of the things that I practice is called gemstone therapy. Gemstones themselves are stones that have been cut and polished. Um, we, we emphasize the sort of perfection, the innate um, energetic perfection of crystals as well as their their physical beauty by having them polished. And if we think about the way gem therapy works, we're using very high quality stones. And it's very seldom that you're going to find a large specimen of anything that is perfect from top to bottom. So we use cut and polished specimens because it's like that that potentized extract of the, the healing properties of it. <clears throat> if you go see an herbalist and they're trying to make a recommendation on a plant that can make you better, they don't walk you into the garden and say, okay, go lick this leaf. Instead, they, they take the leaf or the bark or the roots and they extract it in some form or another. Maybe it becomes a tincture, maybe it's a decoction, um, maybe it's an infusion, but they have to pull out the most beneficial compounds from that botanical matter to give you the medicine. And in gem therapy, we do the same thing. We actually cut and polish gemstones to find that most concentrated, perfect, unblemished um, extract of, of what that gemstone can be. Mm -hmm. So that way it's free of other inclusions and free of other minerals and free of imperfections. So you get a really concentrated dose of gemstone energy. Yeah, that, so that's think, really interesting to, to remove other minerals that may be physically attached to it. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's, it's one method of approaching it. It's certainly not the only method. Um, but you know, I've seen amazing results with gem therapy tools, mm -hmm. just like I've seen amazing results with unpolished raw mineral specimens. So I don't think one is inherently better than the other. They're just different approaches. Yeah. You know, I always give this example of, um, I'm, I'm more of a raw person. Like I, I prefer, I, I do woodworking and I prefer a live edge to wood or, um, when I'm looking at crystals, I, I like the fact that it's, uh, um, jagged and that's just a personal preference based purely on aesthetics, but I um I was gifted a pair of bookends, these huge go um, geode bookends from Hawaii that a friend gave me, and on one side it's um it's just polished, you know, like um you, you know these I'm sure you've seen these a million times. They're not like the ones that are dyed or anything, but they're they're natural, but they're they're perfectly smooth. And when I moved to this house, we packed them away. They weigh a ton, and one cracked open on the way. And I, I just think that the crack side is what I display now. <laughs> it's just absolutely beautiful. And part of me thinks that, and um, this might be a wacky um, thing to say, but I felt like it wanted to be freed in a way, <laughs> like it wanted to separate. And I put the other one away. I just think that you know, I'm not going to intentionally take a hammer to it or something, but I just think it's so much more beautiful to see this um um, like li I'll call it live edge of the stone instead of it just being machine polished. And um, I, I don't even know the process that they would do for something like that, but I'm assuming it's, it's pretty aggressive. Um, and you know, I, I do feel as though stones as dirty as the little yellow ones that you might find in the ground in your backyard to a beautiful, um, you know, gemstone. I, I think they're all ancient and beautiful and, in a lot of ways, they hold a certain amount of energy. Um, but I'm a novice. I, I really don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to how to isolate those energies and um, and put them to use, I guess. Um, and that's the end of my story. 
um, I, I do like the fact that the stone cracked in half and uh, even my friend agrees. He's like, Oh yeah, it looks so much better now. <laughs> it's a few things that I think happens with. Um, now you also have a method for cleansing crystals um, or different stones. Do you recommend cleansing or, and when I say cleansing, I mean the energies. Do you recommend that to anyone who acquires a new stone or do you think that it's, based purely upon their own physical uh, or um, the way they feel about the stone? Uh, I mean, personally, when it comes to people working with crystals, uh, I don't think anyone cleanses often enough. Um, you know, let's, let's use a really good example. We sleep in the same bed, most of us, every night, unless we're away from home. Mm -hmm. And we sweat every night, but we don't necessarily change the sheets every night. We have different levels of what we're comfortable with. You might you might go a couple of nights, you might go a week, some people might go longer than that. But ultimately, if we think about what's happening, if we think too much about it, it makes us want to go change our sheets. Yeah, well, sure. we're doing the same thing, energetically speaking. You know, it's not not physical sweat, but we are exuding energies, disharmony. We're, we're we're sort of casting all these things from us at any given moment. And crystals are natural recorders. They have this ability to retain a memory of things. And so if that memory isn't pure and perfect and good and wonderful, then we probably don't want to carry it around with us every single day. So in my own practice, I have different methods that I use to cleanse crystals depending on how intensively I'm working with them. Um, and there are probably as many different cleansing methods as there are different crystal practitioners out there. Um, but this is one of those cases where you really want to know what's going on with the mineral science of your specimen so you don't do more harm than good. Let's say you want to cleanse under you know, the radiant light of the full sun. Well, if you leave some kunzite or some blue fluorite or aquamarine or calcite or amethyst out in full sun, they're going to lose their color sooner than you might imagine. Mm. Um, if we put something delicate uh, in salt, it might get scratched. If we put some things in water, the, the surface can be marred even by the dissolved solids in your tap water, uh, let alone there are some minerals that are friable that can you know splinter when wet and others that dissolve when wet. So uh, one of my favorite methods employs the breath, um, and it was pioneered by a gentleman by the name of Marcel Vogel. And he was a research scientist for IBM for 27 years, and he uses the breath. Mm. Um, and some uh, combined visualization with it. And if we breathe in a very specific way, it ionizes the breath. It generates a very tiny but measurable electric charge. And that will actually interact with the crystal lattice and kind of wipe the slate clean. So we have this beautiful, blank, pristine energy that we can then imbue with whatever our intention or goal is for the day. Um, and one of the reasons I love this is you don't have to have props with you. You know, you don't have to remember to bring your singing bowl or your dish of salt or wait for a full moon. You always have your breath, and if you don't, you have a bigger problem than a dirty crystal. <laughs> it's interesting you call them props. Um, I, I practice um, TM, Transcendental Meditation, and the reason why I like TM is because you don't need props. Like you don't. It's really, wherever you are, if you have 20 minutes, you can really do it. Um, and it's something I practice for about 20 years now. Um, do you feel as though these type of things should be as basic as that really it seems like you really are such a sim like your process is really about simplicity and knowledge i mean it's really that that's the the um that's it in, in a nutshell maybe you know, to a certain extent, I think simplicity is wonderful. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I said I never overcomplicated things in life. Of course. I've made, I've We're made humans. Crystal grids. Come on. Right. You know, I've made crystal grids that took up entire rooms. I've oh. done, you know, layouts that required pounds and pounds of crystals on and around my clients, you know, within within the realm of comfort, of course. Um, but, you know, those, those are situations when, you know, the opportunity presented itself to do something that was larger than life. And two, it was, it was an appropriate time to mm -hmm. do it. Um, everybody involved was, was prepared for that kind of work. So, you know, when it comes to simplicity versus complexity, I think there's a different tool for every situation. And, um, generally speaking, simpler is often better. Um, if we look at the exercises, for example, in, in any of my books, they really aren't super complicated to do, uh, most of the layouts that you'll see or most of the, like the crystal healing exercises in there. Um, a lot of them require maybe one stone 
or just a small handful of stones. There are a few that are a little bit more complex than that. Um, but I tried to distill it down so that way, um, you know, those of us who have been working with crystals for quite a long time can go deeper with some of their old favorites or maybe meet some new gemstones in ways that they never have before. And those of us who are just beginning don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to buy a hundred stones just to do this one layout. Mm. Um, so it becomes accessible from both ends of the spectrum. Um, out of your books, which do you recommend for somebody who might want to get um, their feet wet and see if this is something that they they want to pursue or, or just learn more about? Uh, I think crystal healing for the heart is probably my most uh, beginner friendly of all of my crystal books. Not that any of them will ostracize people at the beginning of their journey, but um, it has a, an appendix of crystal basics to sort of coach you through some methods for selecting stones, for cleansing them, and gives you more than one option, as well as um, some tips and tricks for um, you know, imbuing them with purpose. Mm -hmm. And then the way that the book is broken down, instead of being a, a dictionary of crystal properties, it's organized by theme. So you've got a chapter on strengthening the heart or a chapter on forgiveness, for example. And all of the stones in that chapter will relate to that theme, but come from different perspectives. So we can kind of compare and contrast how the stones work, mm. even when they seem to have a, a similar purpose. And then every chapter is full of exercises to help you integrate whatever that lesson is. So that way you have a hands-on way to use the stones instead of it just becoming, well, you know, rose quartz is for love and I have some rose quartz, but why don't I feel more loved? Right, um, right. You know, there's there's got to be something intentional about that relationship. Otherwise, they're just beautiful objects. They're certainly doing something in the background, but the the less intentional we are, the less we put in, the less we get out. Hmm. Now, when um, I used to work in this kind of, um, I, don't, I still don't know how to really describe it, but uh, basically a new age bookstore, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to go to different conventions and meet different people who would sell us basically crystals by the pound. You know, like we would just buy 10 pounds of different crystal. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you just get a bad vibe from the seller, you know, and it's like, oh, I don't really, you know, you seem like a real jerk, you know. <laughs> you know, and it's like, um, as a New Yorker, I, I feel like I can just judge people like that. So um, I apologize if that's too blunt. But I just, I feel like, you get this, you know, you get a ton of any type of crystal and, you know, you're offering it to the next level, you know, the next level of people. And we would have people who would just go through it. Um, I mean, this was the, it was in a beach community. People just kind of hang out all day. I don't know how the place even stayed in business, to be honest with you. But, you know, people would literally go through it for hours, um, choosing, you know, you know a, a half a pound of crystals. And, it's just amazing, I, like just watching it from a spectator point of view, that some people who would just take a handful and just run with it, and then the, a person who is really kind of going through each one and really taking their time and hand selecting. Um, I do. I, I just think it's it's very important that if you're going and getting into crystals, to choose ones that are correct. But I also think it's important to choose them from people who who care enough to say, no, I don't think this is the right supplier. And where do you recommend? Like, do you have a place or, like, where do you get your stones, I guess? Um, do you just find them? Is this something? Do you have a source? Do you offer stones? You know, I buy from all over. I buy both wholesale. I buy retail. And I apologize because um, I go on tangents sometimes. So. Yeah. Just feel free to you just know, stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. You know, I, I have so many wonderful people that I buy from that it would be unfair for me to single anyone out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, ultimately when, when we're looking for tools, we want to find the tools that are the right ones for us. Sure. And that's not necessarily because a book said so. It's because we feel that sort of intrinsic relationship with them. You've got that inexplicable draw or conversely, they make you want to turn tail and run the other way. Those are often our biggest teachers. You know, all the crystals that give us that warm, fuzzy kind of empowered feeling, they tend to represent spiritual lessons that our soul has already mastered on one level or another. And it's the ones that tend to rock the boat a little bit that represent some lessons we have yet to learn. Yeah. So I'm not suggesting go find the most uncomfortable crystal in the world and carry it with you all day, every day. Um, nobody, nobody would enjoy that. Neither you nor the stone nor the people around you. Um, but those might be some really great tools to use for some 
profound, focused, and short meditations. You know, maybe five or 15 minutes in the beginning, and then you kind of stretch it out from there. And then you go back to those stones that make you feel, you know, all warm and fuzzy. So, um, you know, the way we approach finding stones is going to be different for each of us. It depends on their purpose. If you're shopping for something to carry in your pocket, obviously you're probably going to look for something with different size parameters and something that is going to, you know, fill a large space. If you've got a, a huge um, sort of community center and you want to have a, a, a big crystal to go in the center of that room, it's not going to fit in the pocket. Um, if you want something that lays on the body, you might not look for a sphere because that'll roll off too easily. So um, it's just important to to remember that, you know, form follows function and we have to, you know, find the right crystal for the right job and hopefully for the right price. Although I think anyone who's been doing this long enough has has made some, we'll say, adventurous purchasing decisions. Mm -hmm. With anything, I mean, there's different levels of quality and I, I think you can you can go broke with almost anything, right? It's true. Um, do you carry any stones physically? Like, um, I hate to even say a good luck <clears throat> charm, but not really. Like, do you have a yeah, favorite I, stone, I guess? <laughs> well, I, I have I have a favorite mineral, but I, it's not necessarily the one I always carry with me because I try to match the tools for the job that I have in front mm. of me. So, you know, if I'm going out and speaking, I might have a, a different set of tools than if I am at home writing or, you know, if I'm just not feeling well for the day, I would choose different gemstones to wear than if I, I feel really great and empowered. So, mm. um, you know, I, I cycle through, I have a large collection of things that are both wearable and carryable. Um, and I, I try to just kind of tune in each day and pick the right tool for the right job. Wow. Um, you know, I have a friend, he, um, plays guitar and, uh, he was actually my guitar teacher and just a good friend of mine. And he actually, he has a number of different stones and he actually has a spot in his guitar depending on how he's feeling that day when he's about to perform and he'll just kind of pop it in there, you know? And I just think that's a pretty cool idea, you know, for musicians who, who might want to embrace it. And, um, he's, he's kind of a jam band type of person. So he's, he's a lot about emotions, um, with music and, um. He just said it, it calms him while he's on stage. It gives him a little bit of um, um, a safety net, and he feels comfortable with it. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I think I'd never heard anyone else doing it, so I just thought that was kind of a, a cool thing. I told him he should invent a little device for guitarists <laughs> to put in their strap or something. Um, yeah. So, um, so I have a ten-year-old who plays Minecraft. Okay, and I don't know if you have any, if you even know Minecraft. Um, and if you don't, I consider you lucky <laughs> because Minecraft makes little sense to me. Um, have you ever heard of it or do you know anything I, about I've it? I've heard of it. I, I don't know much about it, however. Um, essentially what it is is a, it's a flat world where you can build things. You, know, you can craft things. But my it's opened my son up to um, minerals because you – you have to find minerals and combine them and create things like iron and steel. And, um, and he's talking about obsidian and he's talking about things that I never talked about at 10, you know, um, having to do with, um, stones and gemstones. And, um, I was just hoping that you knew about Minecraft and maybe even, <laughs> maybe even after this, if, um, if you just go and bore yourself with an article about Minecraft, I'm just curious, um, about the legitimacy behind the the use of it. And maybe there's even a philosophy behind it because it's a very, very deep game. And um, it, it's a game with no rules. There's a game with no point system. It's just a, cre a game of creation. And um, I would just love your take, even if it's just through an email or something, um, your opinion of, well, you know, it, there's really no philosophy behind it it would just um I, I would love that if i could just bother you to do that um in the future um so but nonetheless it makes my son go to google and look up obsidian and learn about different things like that which i think um can't be bad um yeah and you, you know there's a growing trend of this you know we've got uh, Steven Universe is a cartoon built around these sort of anthropomorphized gemstones. We're seeing them factoring into video games. The fashion industry mm -hmm. has sort of co-opted gems now for for more than just their beauty, but, you know, for the meaning that's inherent in them. And while all of these may be kind of very 
surface level, tip of the iceberg kind of interpretations. It's opening a door for more and more people to come into um, spirituality and integrative medicine and, you know, find a personal practice that supports the whole person. Mm -hmm. And um, I think they're all valid doorways. They might not all be factual and accurate, but the fact that they are getting people into the fold is valuable. Right. I think if we can get the conversation going, even if it's by somebody who might not be as knowledgeable as you, but um, I'm sure they could reach out with you and create a, you know, <laughs> you know, pay you for your time and possibly create something that's um, accurate. But um, that I would personally think that would just be a really great thing without it being, you know, um, new agey and heavy handed. Um, I think that right now, for instance, we're, we're at a very, I never talk politics. I'm still not going to talk politics, but it's a very turbulent world that we live in right now, uh, whether it's inside or outside of this country. And I feel as though maybe there may be um, a turn. There may be a turn back to this lost understanding, a, a, a simpler um, way. I mean, a lot of people might look at this as being more complex, but I, I look at it as a little bit more simple. And... Um, a, a turn to more of a spiritual world. Um, I sound a little dippy now. So um, I, I do want to ask you about mixing uh, your practice of, you know, crystal healing with, you know, incense or essential oils. These are, these are all things I normally do um, based purely on what I personally like. I don't do them with any type of real study. You know, um, you know, like eucalyptus, for instance, is something I'll, um, I have an infuser and I like it. It wakes me up like I'm having coffee and I'll, it helps me focus. Um, other people, I think it reacts very differently, but do you use essential oils or incense with, um, either your healing or, um, with any of this, with the cleansing or meditation? You know, I think that, you know, the world of, you know, crystals specifically, but sort of the greater world of spirituality that it's part of or adjacent to is is so customizable that you're really able to mix and match whatever works for you. I, I work a lot with flower essences, um, which have no scent, but they're kind of like vibrational remedies made from, from flowers. Um, I do occasionally work with essential oils, but it's not the mainstay of my practice. I have a fairly sensitive respiratory system, so oh. I, don't, I don't like to diffuse or burn a whole lot. There are things that I can get away with. Um, I don't necessarily use them intentionally with, uh, you know, pairing a specific botanical scent or combination with a specific gemstone, but mm -hmm. it's kind of a mood setting thing. Uh, when I see clients, I rarely ever use those things because you never know what someone is going to like or dislike or be allergic to. Um, so you always be really mindful of that when you're working with other people. Um, we can't presuppose what is going to work for them and what isn't because if we're wrong, it can have really bad results. Sure. Um, so you were mentioning before about the um, breath process of cleansing mm -hmm. crystals. And I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, now, you know, with our meditations, of course, like you know, we focus on our breathing and um, and just kind of being deliberate with our breathing. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering, does that play a role into it? Um, do we get to a state where of meditation while we're breathing, or is it a deliberate? breath or uh, you know i'm just i guess is this something that somebody can just learn to do if they are already comfortable with meditation or absolutely i mean this is something i teach beginners in virtually every one of my intro classes um you know breath is our very first gift when we enter this world it's the first thing we receive when we leave the mother's womb so you know breath has this primal effect on us and when we breathe intentionally not even correctly if we just breathe intentionally we start to shift our consciousness and shift our per perception um so um you know there there are probably a million and one different ways that we can breathe um for meditation and so um you know this one has a little bit of foundation and sort of like the the pranayama style breathing, the sort of yogic, you know, deep three-part breath. Um, but there's also a little bit of science involved because the the man who pioneered it was himself a scientist. Sure. So, I mean, um, that's, I, that's always like really nice to hear. You know, it's <clears throat> like right. this person has a, a cold science background <laughs> and he's right. applying it to, you know, something that's, um, 
you know, um, spiritual. Right. And I mean, the, the method itself is really simple. Essentially, you're, you're visualizing some symbol of purification. I usually suggest white light, but it could be, you know, a cool running stream or whatever else represents cleansing to you. And then, um, you know, we, we breathe deeply and intentionally and fill ourselves with that image. And we pulse the breath in a short mm-hmm. and sharp exhale through the nose. And, you know, all of that is in the book. So that way people can really get a, a, a keen understanding of it. It's right there in the introduction of my very first book because it's it's great to start with the breath because then we're not even starting with props or tools we're just uh, starting with what's within us and i'm sorry which book was that in again was that crystal healing for the heart um that one is in seven archetypal stones gotcha. um and it's it's revisited in a little bit more detail in uh crystals for karmic healing as well mm. um i give people some alternative cleansing methods in crystal healing for the heart just so that way i didn't rehash the same technique over sure. and over and over again um now in the foundations of reiki rioho Mm-hmm. You um, also examine the history of this. You know, you, you given um, more than just an overview of um, the evolution of Reiki and the history of it. Um, and you also um, you examine the core teachings of the Reiki founder. Um, and I'm going to butcher this one. Um, maybe not Usu Macau. Yeah, okay. Usui Mikau. He was, he was the founder of Reiki, had this beautiful experience of Satori or, or awakening or enlightenment on Mount Kurama in 1922. And he'd been a lifelong spiritual seeker. And, you know, essentially he, he distilled that, that experience plus his decades of, of yearning into what became the system of Reiki. Mm. Um, you know, it went through a few iterations in the beginning and continues to go through iterations today. It is evolving. It is a living, breathing practice. Um, and he passed and away clearly, right? I don't know when he, he had this awakening. Yeah, um, he he had his his satori in uh, 1922, mm-hmm. and then in 1926 he left the world. Oh, okay. Um, did you ever ever have an opportunity to speak with anyone who um, who met him or or practiced with him? I did not. Yeah, um, I mean, how, it's however, probably very difficult to find somebody from the period. Right. And, you know, there, there are a lot of inherent challenges in that, not just the, the amount of time that has elapsed, but also um, culture, language, and distance. Sure, absolutely. Um, I did travel to Japan in 2009 to do some research. Um, I was very limited in what I had access to then, but I made some connections that were really helpful, and I got to visit some of the sacred sites associated with Reiki, including um, Usui Sensei's memorial stone, the place where wow. his students erected the story of his li- uh, life and teachings. Um, at his uh, family grave, I went to Mount Kurama where he had his uh, experience of awakening. Um, so it was it was a beautiful trip that has sort of etched itself onto my soul ever since. Um, but I, I've been gifted enough to practice uh, Jikiden Leiki, which is a, a relatively unaltered form of practice that preserves the teachings of one of Usui's most well-known students. Um, his name was Hayashi Chujiro. Um, Hayashi had at least some connection to the medical community. Um, he wasn't a proper doctor or surgeon, as some of the stories will tell us, but we know that he was some sort of healthcare provider at some point in his life. Um, he wow. paid taxes as such. And so he was able to bring Reiki into a, a more public space because of that. Um, whatever licensure or whatever training he had, it, it enabled him to have a, a public clinic. Um, and in Jihiden Reiki, we, we actually practice the same techniques that he taught in the 1930s and 40s. Mm. So, um, you know, my one of my teachers in the Jikiden Reiki system, his teacher learned directly from Hayashi, who learned directly from Usui himself. So it's it's a very short lineage, but, you know, length of our lineage, complexity of our lineage, one does not equate to being a better practitioner than the other. Um, the only thing that makes you a better practitioner is practice. Mm-hmm. So you could have 45 people between you and the founder and still be... Uh, a more effective practitioner if you're doing it every day than someone who has five or six links in their chain and maybe uses it once a month. Hmm. Now, do you do um, one-on-one um, counseling or um, healing? <clears throat> um, I do see people for, for private sessions. I, I certainly wouldn't call it counseling. Um, I don't see clients as often as I, I once did because there are a lot of demands on my schedule. I, I teach very very often. So um, although it's great to have that practice, I'd, I'd much rather empower someone to have the skills to use it in their own life, then they don't have to come see me. They can, mm. they can take their matters into their own hands, quite literally. Yeah. I mean, it just sounds um, like we said earlier, you know, getting to the root of it, you know, getting to 
you know, as, as connected to the creation of it as possible. And it certainly sounds like, you know, you've done your best to do that. How did you feel about Japan in general? Like you, you said you really, um, it, it was a place that really affected you, but, um, do you see it as a place that you'll return to? And I ask this because I, I mentioned before, I normally have a co-host, um, Alex and he's in Vietnam now, I think entering his fifth month. Um, he met, um, he just loves, um, Asian culture in general, but, he just has the opportunity to do a lot of traveling and um, he's, I think he might be there permanently. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I think he's just, uh, he has this apartment in Astoria that um, I don't know. He used to either, you know, he has to do something with it. Cause I don't know how long he can afford this lifestyle. <laughs> I mean, I would love to go back to Japan. I have some tentative plans to go back in uh, a few years in 2022. It'll be uh, one, 100 years from the birth of Reiki. So oh, wow. there are some some plans crystallizing for uh, some prominent researchers and teachers to kind of bring the community together to celebrate the centennial of, of Reiki. Um, and I would surely love to attend that, um, even if I'm just a you know a, an anonymous face in the crowd, just to be there and oh, be yeah. present with people gathered from all around the world. I think that it's so important, that. these things. I feel as though being in a location where... Th- something like that, that you have a a true love and passion for. Um, it's just, it just is physically important and wonderful. Um, whether it be, you know, visiting something because of a terrible thing that happened and how it might affect you, but the birthplace for something that you clearly have dedicated your life to is, um, certainly a, a wonderful way to spend, um, you know, um, a trip or, a des- have a destination for that. And that's awesome. I-, I hope you do that. I sure hope so as well. You're doing it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, so are you working on anything moving forward? Like, um, do you have any, um, processes and, and also what is the, uh, what is the next step with Reiki? I mean, I think that maybe with the 100 year anniversary approaching so quickly, Maybe it it is possible that a certain um, popularity will be, um, well, it is pretty popular, but even more ignited. And um, people might give it um, a closer look. Yeah, so um, I'll I'll break this down into... I ask a million questions and one, I'm sorry. That's okay. So uh, first step, you know, what am I working on? I actually have a new book coming out in February, February 19th. I'm launching my fifth book and it's called uh, Stones of the Goddess, Crystals for the Divine Feminine. Um, it's an exploration between the sort of energy of the divine feminine and the the role it plays in human consciousness and human evolution and how that is reflected in the mineral kingdom, how we can access mm. that current of energy and honor the divine feminine through, through you know, rock, gem, mineral, and fossil. So um, I'm super excited about this. It is my biggest work to date. It covers more rocks than any of my others. It's very lavishly illustrated. The whole thing was sort of this act of devotion to the divine feminine. Um, and I'm really, really excited. Oh, I see you're taking it. pre-orders on it, too. Yeah, it's, it's available to pre-order on Amazon and through other outlets as well already. Um, and then my... I'm I'm about we'll say 90% done with the book that comes out after that, which currently has no release date, no official title, so I won't give anything <laughs> away except to say that there's a lot more in store from Nicholas. Um, and then as far as like next steps with Reiki, um, I really see um, sort of bringing more integrative medicine into allopathic medical care being a big next step, not just for Reiki but for a lot of healing modalities. Um, one of my dear colleagues, uh, Raven Keys. Uh, has a, a medical Reiki master training program that actually accredits you to get into the um, surgical theater and assist, you know, surgical teams. You're right there with mm-hmm. with people as they go under the knife, um, as well as helping them in other parts of the medical process. She is going to be starting um, with a board of directors and physicians, um, some some more scientific study, some more medical study of the efficacy of Reiki in the operating room. Um, I really think that medicine is starting to catch on, and we're 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 aware that this is not just the placebo effect, but mm-hmm. you know science science prides itself on being able to measure and quantify things. So we have to go out and measure and quantify things so we can understand that mechanism. So more of that is definitely going to be happening, and I think more and more people are going to be returning to the roots of Reiki as well. You know, the Jikiden Reiki Institute is flourishing; it has tens of thousands of practitioners. 
um, worldwide now that all belong to this very, very um, historically accurate set of teachings. There will be more things that I'm sure emerge from Japan, you know, more people whose grandpa's grandpa learned from so-and-so and, you know, they haven't, they haven't really shared it publicly, but more of that kind of thing will pop up because it always does. Um, and I, I'm really hoping that what we're going to see is more reconciliation among the different Reiki lineages, because here in the West, we had one version of events, one, one sort of mythologized, uh, embroidered history, if you will, mm -hmm. something not entirely factual, but something that was poetic. And in that sort of mythopoetic nature, it, it still taught the necessary lessons, but it was adapted to meet its Western audience at a time when it was really challenging to be Japanese. But as, as lineages that are really entrenched in that version of events um, reconcile their version with the historical facts that we can back up with, you know, actual um, written materials and, and everything that we're finding in Japan. I think as, as we learn to let go of our differences, we'll focus on the one thing that unites us, and that's the system itself. Even if our external form varies from practitioner to practitioner, we're all here doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're all just human beings. And one of the beautiful things about Reiki is it speaks directly to our soul. And that's something we all share in common. That's, it, it really is fascinating. And um, I, I really do recommend people to, if you have an interest in you know, getting into um, just stones and crystals, or um, and especially Reiki, to definitely check out Nic um, Nicholas Pearson's books. Now, you are under um, Inner Traditions. They're your publisher. They are, and they're amazing to work with. They have such, they have so many great authors, such um, just like you, and they really are a great, great, great um, place. Like it's a one-stop destination for a lot of um, alternative. Um, I, I hate using all, the word alternative, but these, uh, you know, out thinking out of the box on a lot of different topics, and um, really, really great stuff. They seem to be a really great company, and you seem to have a pretty good relationship with them. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. They do everything with so much integrity. Um, they're so visionary. They'll they'll publish things because they're important, not necessarily just because they're going to sell. Mm -hmm. um, and they they really do believe in their authors, and that that means the world to me. As when I was a first time author, getting into this, just just to think that someone someone was invested in my work and willing to help me hone that work and make it beautiful and presentable and coherent enough to present to the world at large. Now, do you do any kind of book signings or any kind of meeting greets? I do. I, I actually have a pretty active schedule of events. Um, the easiest place to see them all is on my Amazon author page. Um, once I get in touch with my publicist, they will also be on my author page on the Inner Traditions website. Great. And one of these days, my website will also host my, my calendar, <laughs> but it's not there yet. <laughs> it's too much work, right? I mean, it's, there's, <laughs> to keep up with just websites and um, the technology, it's a whole other job. It's wild. It um but um, I'll put a link to everything in the show notes so people can just kind of click on it and check that out. Um, but um, right now, the best way to reach you might be, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, theluminouspearl.com. Absolutely. There's a contact form right on there. There's not a whole else. There's not a whole lot else there, but you can certainly reach me directly. Um, I also have a Facebook page, which is just facebook.com slash the luminous pearl. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm easily reachable there and my events are usually posted there also. Well, Nicholas, I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Um, I, I think you've inspired me. I have a lot of crystals from um, when I moved. I, I packed them all the way. And I feel guilty about that. I, I really do. And I, I feel like it's time to kind of seek them out, find them, and maybe read up on this process of cleansing them with breath. I, For whatever reason, that kind of um, really jives with me. It, it just seems to make sense to me. So I'm going to look into that process and... Um, no, I do appreciate all the, um, all the information that you've shared it's and, my pleasure. Uh, and, um, hopefully I can, um, get you to come back on in the future if you want to discuss this next book and yeah, absolutely. It looks awesome. The, um, stones of the goddess, which looks really awesome. And I'll put a link to that as well. Um, if people want to sign up for that and get an early copy of that, not an early copy, but a copy when it gets released. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. I'll put everything in the show notes, and um, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much for having me.